wrestle, 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 hard, wrestle, 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 hard, wrestle, 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 wrestle. And welcome back to Mindset Monday. I'm Gene Zanetti, your coast-to-coast -coast mindset coach from Wrestling Mindset. And today we're bringing you Mindset Monday from the Zanetti office in the backyard. Today we're going through Chapter 3 of Developing the Predator Mindset. My book that we have out there, bestseller on Amazon, really encapsulating, really setting, I, I look at it more setting the stage for all of our mindset lessons, this predator-prey mindset really important. It's just an analogy. It's a metaphor. It's never to be taken literally. It's used to help us to look at the, it's a frame of reference from which we could easily evaluate our thoughts into productive thoughts versus unproductive thoughts. And if you recall, we said the predator mindset means nothing more than focusing on the controllables, your effort, your attitude, your aggressiveness, things like your lifestyle and your preparation. You could directly control that at every moment. The prey mindset is focusing on things outside of our control, and that's what chapter two is today of building the predator mindset. So we're going to go through parts of that. We're going to go through parts of that today. We're going to be talking about an introduction to the prey mindset as well as the fan mentality. So we're going to be reading a, a piece, like one-third, the introduction of chapter two and, and one-third of it. So it's, it's a lengthier chapter. So we'll, we'll take it from the top. Chapter two, avoiding the prey mindset. And again, it's from Develop the Predator Mindset, Win in Sports, and Life. You can find it on Amazon. Eyes on the side like to hide. The stakes are high for meerkats, animals of the mongoose family. Think Timon from the Lion King in South Africa. A dominant pair, usually the biggest male and female, do the majority of the breeding. Competition is fierce for the number one spot. Meerkats instinctively know the pressure they are under. To improve their chances of success... Some meerkats adopt a certain strategy. They compare their own size to that of their rivals. As their rivals grow larger, many meerkats begin to eat more, the, eat more themselves to keep pace with their opponent's size. These meerkats have adopted a prey mindset, comparing themselves to their rivals. Consequently, only halfway through the process of trying to eat more, these meerkats give up. They have wasted their efforts trying to keep up with the Joneses in extra foraging and have thus opened themselves up to other dangers. This is a small example of what I've seen to be the number one problem in competition, the prey mindset. Like it or not, we live in a highly competitive society. Very often, we only get one chance to seize the day, and we need to know how to make it count. After working with tens and thousands of athletes of all ages around the country, I can confidently say that having a prey mindset is one of the surest ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Prey animals are focused primarily on what's going on around them. We can extend this analogy to sports, school, business, and other areas of our lives that are outside of our control. The prey mindset can be broken down into three broad categories. To remember these categories, keep in mind that the prey mindset is our real-life foe, F-O-E, F, fan mentality, O, other people, E, extraneous var variables, prey mindset, fan mentality. In competition, the fan mentality is public enemy number one. Back in my college wrestling days at UPenn, my team was in the national duels at Arizona State competing against the best of the best, the top college wrestling teams in the country. During one of the rounds of the tournament, our team had a bye. During our off round, Iowa and Oklahoma State, the, number, the two top teams in the country at the time, were competing against each other. As excitable college kids, we naturally anticipated watching these two dynasty programs compete against each other for the number one spot. We were taking our picks about which wrestlers would win each weight class and which team would win the overall duel. Minutes before the match began, our spirits were crushed. Men, we're not spectators here. We're competitors, and we're not watching this match. We're going into the back room to recover to get ready for our match. This was coming from our head coach, Zeke Jones, world champion, Olympic silver medalist, and one of the few Americans ever to win most technical wrestler in the world. We wanted to watch the top teams compete. But instead, we learned an important lesson that day. Champions must have their mindset of predators, not prey. We should focus more on getting ourselves prepared than on the other matches. The reality is that society, the media, and even our friends and family have taught us this prey mindset of fan mentality. We are well trained to think like fans. During the playoffs of any sport, 
and even well before, we are inundated with records, brackets, rankings, seedings, predictions, storylines, and Vegas odds. These are not bad in and of themselves. They're in fact great for sports. This kind of information makes sports more fun to watch. We love to know about the personal lives of athletes and the struggles they have to overcome. We love to see the 40 to one underdog shock the world. It's exciting to fill out the brackets for the NCAAs and compare them to the predictions of our friends. Social media only compounds this excitement. We can follow what athletes are saying and doing before, during and after the competitions in real time. But as a result, the tendency to fall into the fan mentality is greater now than in any time period in the history of the world. And it's gonna to continue to grow. In other words, the fan mentality is not inherently bad, but it's problematic when we take this mentality into competition. The fan mentality can be broken down into three subcategories. One, hype. Two, significance. Three, outcome. The examples I mentioned above all fall under the subcategory of hype. Records, rankings, seedings, predictions, storylines, forums, Vegas odds, etc. are all factors that add to the hype. These factors are outside of the control of the competitor and have very little to do with the competition itself. Athletes get involved in the hype all the time. They're usually well aware of their personal record and ranking. Coaches even contribute to this by posting rankings and records in the locker room and practice room. Coaches do this with good intentions to motivate their athletes, but athletes often internalize these rankings and records as fixed entities, leading to detrimental results in competition. The seedings or storylines doesn't have to, anything to do with competition, so throw that out of your mind. LeBron James is well aware of how the hype increases during the playoffs. To counteract this hype, he goes on a social media blackout. By doing this, he does not see what others are saying about him or about the upcoming competition. I remember watching an interview in which the commentator asked him if he heard a negative remark of a former coach that had made about him. He said that he had no idea about any remark because he abstains from social media during the playoffs. LeBron does it right. Many athletes do the opposite. Athletes usually begin posting more on social media during the postseason. Sure, it's exciting to see the hundreds and thousands of likes, hearts, views, and shares on your Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook pages. But the question is, does this posting help or hurt your performance? One of the top wrestlers in New Jersey High School found himself in the final tournament of the season against a familiar opponent. He beat this opponent in the prestigious Christmas tournament earlier in the year by 10 points. Before the state finals, he posted a picture on Instagram along with a heartfelt message to all his supporters and fans throughout the years and exclaimed that he was looking forward to putting on his team singlet one last time in a championship match. He's a great kid. My recommendation would have been to write this post after the match. After demolishing the opponent earlier in the year, he squeaked by in an overtime in a match that he almost lost. He did not write a heartfelt post to all of his fans before the Christmas tournament when he won big, but he changed his approach before his finals match, and it almost cost him. I've seen heavy favorites lose focus before the Olympics, promoting themselves and their sponsored products, over-communicating with fans on social media, and taking too many interviews. Indeed, after some gold medal hopefuls didn't even place, their coaches admitted that the athletes got caught up in the hype. One of these athletes made the necessary adjustments for the world championships the following year, avoiding social media before the tournament. He was not even paying attention to the brackets or draw before. This athlete went on to win his fifth world title. He was back on top with a simple shift of mindset. Legendary coach and Olympic champion wrestler Dan Gable was very careful and selective with whom he allowed his team to communicate before competitions. He knew the important, he knew the impact of hype on the mindset of his athletes. In the movie Miracle, recall the legendary coach Herb Brooks, who was the mastermind behind the miracle on the ice. He wouldn't let his hockey players talk to the press before or after the games. He wouldn't even let the U.S. Hockey Committee, committee into the locker room before the game. The committee, though disappointed, understood his reasoning after the U.S. team pulled off one of the greatest upsets of all time in any sport. And that's the first part, because related to the, the next chapter, the next part two of the chapter starts with related to the hype is the second part of the fan mentality, focusing on the con significance of the competition. Oh, no, this is still part of the hype. This isn't part of the, the oh, the other people. So we'll keep going. Related to the hype is the second part of the fan mentality, focusing on the significance of a competition. Nine out of 10 times, if we make a competition special, we perform worse. The goal is to make every performance important, 
but not special. There is a big difference. We, over, we overestimate and underestimate opponents when we focus on the significance of an event. To succeed, you want to treat everything the same. If you listen to the top performers in any field, they always bring up the C word, and it's not confidence, it's consistency. We all perform well sometimes, but unfortunately not others. We want to perform consistently well. That begins by treating every, every competition the same. Bruce Springsteen is well known for the energy he brings on stage. He broke the New Jersey state record a few years ago for the longest performance, his own record. An interviewer once asked him how he brings so much energy to each and every show. He told the interviewer that he tells himself two things before his performances. One, this is the most important concert of my life. And two, it's only rock and roll. The boss makes every concert important, but not special. Former President Bill Clinton underwent several major heart surgeries. Imagine the pressure felt by the surgeons operating on a former president. One of the surgeons shared his mindset after the op operation. He explained that he treated Clinton like he would treat anyone else. How different most people are when they perform. Here are some of the worst phrases you can tell yourself before a performance or competition. This is it. Now or never. Do or die. Make it or break it. There is no tomorrow. This is what work this is what you worked hard for your whole life. This is what counts. This is the biggest match of, of my life. No doubt you've heard many athletes use this line, and chances are you've said some of these to yourself or to someone else. But for every one person these phrases have helped, they probably hurt 20. The time is now to take your mindset to the next level with wrestling mindset. Make sure you go to our website, WrestlingMindset.com, and sign up for your free trial session today. Don't wait any longer. You want the mental edge right now. When you sign up for the free trial session, you're also going to get a copy of our free ebook, Building the Predator Mindset. This book has helped thousands of people build confidence, relax under pressure, get motivated, and build mental toughness in wrestling, school, and life. Make sure you sign up for your free trial session today. I once had a coach challenge me at a con convention in front of more than 100 of his peers saying, before my wrestler competed in the state finals, he told me this was the biggest moment of his life and he went out to win. I asked him if he thought that it was if it was one of the best wrestler one of the wrestler's best performances and the coach shook his head saying no. I didn't want to make matters worse by pointing out that he'd won a state title in one of the weakest states in the country and if his athlete had performed the state the same in other states he might not have even placed we cannot define our effectiveness based on ex exclusively on wins and losses. Though wins and losses are objective criteria, top athletes and coaches can see how records can be deceiving. They say nothing about the quality of competition, the physical or mental state of the competitors, referees, calls, and many other variables and influences the outcome of the competition. We want our focus to be on thoughts that will bring out our best performance. We tend to use the above deadly phrases because we are stuck in Hollywood sports movies that teach us to hype up events. We watch movies like Miracle, Any Given Sunday, or virtually any sports movie, and we watch a great actor deliver an Academy Award performance of a pregame rah-rah motivational speech, often reducing the coach and athlete to tears. And then we see the team run out onto the field fired up, and we watch them win the big game. I've seen the strategy replicated over and over by parents, coaches, and even myself, and we become puzzled when it doesn't work out quite the same way as it did in the movies. I hate telling the story, but it's so effective in illustrating this point. I always had a flair for the dramatic. My brother Jeff went into the state tournament at the highest placing, as the highest placing returner, wrestler of the top ranked, top seeded of the whole season. I knew there was a good chance he would win. I wrote a very heartfelt speech, which I delivered to him about a half hour before he took the mat in the state finals. Though it was a great moment we shared, culminating in a big bear hug and tears on both of our parts, I realize now that I was doing one of the worst things for his mindset before a competition. I cringe even writing this now as I recall him getting pinned in the state finals by someone I knew he would have beaten in a practice room. The sentiment of the speech I wrote for my brother wasn't wrong. I just should have delivered that speech after the match. There should not have been a pre-match speech since I did not do this for him in practice. There's no reason to add more pressure. If I were to say anything, I should have said what top coaches say. Be yourself. Do what you always do. Just be you out there. Be aggressive. Have fun. Nothing more. At the turn of the century, ESPN named John Wooden the, the Wizard of Westwood the greatest coach of all time. He said that he did not believe in pep talks. He said pep talks create an energy level of peaks and valleys. 
after a spike to a peak in energy level after a pep talk. This would lead to an inevitable low valley soon after in the game when it counts. A wrestler I was coaching had a goal to qualify for the state tournament, but he regularly underperformed in matches relative to his performance in practice. When I asked him about his physical and mental routine before the match, I learned that he would stretch and do a few technical drills, then his dad would give him his usual pre-match speech. I stopped him immediately and asked him if his dad gave him the same speech before wrestling in practice. When the wrestler said no, it was easy to pinpoint the big problem here. You want to practice the way you want to play and play the way you want to practice, minimizing as many variables as possible. If you normally do something or don't do something before performing in practice, and you usually do well, why would you switch things up before performing in a competition? Try to keep things the same. I learned the following exercise from the USOC Sports Psychology Training Manual, and I use this with my athletes to this day. Write down how you can make matches similar to practice and how to make practices similar to a match. This usually entails keeping actions and thoughts as similar as you can. In more extreme cases, a nervous performer may want to take practice performances more seriously and competition performances less seriously, usually overcompensating with actions to make themselves smile and laugh, such as dancing, listening to songs that make them smile, or joking around with a friend or teammate. This is how you overcome the practice room, wrestle, the practice room syndrome. Pete Rose, the all-time baseball hits leader, was nicknamed Charlie Hustle for his constant, aggressive, and relentless style of baseball. He was criticized for taking the All-Star game too seriously after running over a catcher to score a run. What difference does it make if it's an All-Star game, World Series, regu regular season game? I'd play the same way in spring training game. That's how Pete Rose described his mindset, his competitive mindset. He did not distinguish competitions or even practices from one another, and neither should you. I often tell our wrestlers that, that live wrestling is live wrestling wherever it's done. Practice. Match, backyard, New Jersey, Iowa, Russia, Iran, or Mars. The gravity might be different, but it's still the same activity. I learned this lesson and many others from watching interviews after championships in all sports, World Series, Stanley Cups, Super Bowls, Olympics. If you listen to the best athletes' interviews, they usually sound very, they usually sound very different from the this is it Hollywood pep talk. For example, Olympic champ Tom Brands told reporters that the Olympics was like any other tournament or any other match. Kyle Dake, after winning his fourth national championship against David Taylor, one of the best college wrestlers of all time, stunned interviewers when he told them that he treated the finals the same as any match. They couldn't believe it because they knew the significance of the match and the, the quality competition he was up against. Dake exclaimed, explained, you can't let outside factors play a factor in your mindset. We can start to see a pattern here. Dake and Brands were saying the same thing as John Wooden, Springsteen, and Clinton Surgeon said, Treat it the same. Everything is important, but nothing is special. Scratch the pep talks. The third part of the fan mentality is focusing too much on the outcome. As a society, we're very preoccupied with final outcomes. Did you win or lose? What's your record? How much do you bench? How much money do you make? What kind of car do you drive? How many followers do you have on social media? Do you have a girlfriend or not? These questions imply that something is wrong with you if you answer a certain way. We get this even at a young age. I remember working one summer as a camp counselor watching the eighth graders as they played laser tag. After the game, I asked one of the kids, not one of the most active and fit children there, if he enjoyed the game. His immediate response was, we lost. Many children respond immediately with their result or outcome. Ask a kid how their competition went, and nine times out of ten, the kid will tell you if they won or they lost, their record on the day, or their place at the tournament. We want to train kids out of this. Back to that day at summer camp, I asked the kid, all right, well, how did you play? The camp director, who didn't even realize was who I didn't even realize was walking behind us, decided to join our conversation, saying, didn't you hear what he said? He lost. I was shocked that this was coming from an educator and camp director. Surely there's more to the game than winning or losing, I replied. I, couldn't have take, I could have taken it a step further and said that there are better indicators of personal performance than the outcome of the competition, but I figured we were already operating on different wavelengths, so I let the conversation die. Poor kid though, right? Most examples are not nearly as blatant. The outcome focus is usually ingrained in a much more subtle way. Any elementary school student playing sports can see and experience a noticeable difference in the demeanor of their parents, coaches, and teammates after winning versus losing. We begin to internalize the idea that winning is the only good outcome and that losing is bad. 
Many of us live our lives with extreme internalizing of this win at all costs attitude, leading to cheating and overall dissatisfaction with sports and competition in general. I've seen a lot of people who hate competition because they just do not want to see, they just do not want to face the thrill of victory, agony of defeat, moment of truth. We need to have a more productive perspective. In no way am I saying it's wrong to desire a certain outcome over others. It's great to set a goal like becoming a state champion or making a certain income, but there's a proper time and place to focus on your goal. When you're getting ready to perform or actually performing, thinking about your goal only adds pressure. It does not help you. Think instead of the factors within your control that'll help you achieve your goal. When I'm giving a presentation at a coaches convention in front of a hundred, hundreds of people who I admire, it doesn't matter. To, it doesn't help me to think about how many of them are enjoying my presentation. That line of thinking is just a distraction that adds pressure. I'd do much better to focus on factors within my control, my enthusiasm, my intonation, and body language. This brings us to the difference between outcome goals and process goals. Let's, let's cut it there. It's a long chapter, and outcome and process goals would be actually a really good topic for the next discussion that we have. So we see there, just to recap the whole thing to sum it up a little bit. We have the prey mindset. We broke prey mindset down into three categories. The fan mentality, which we covered most of today, other people, and extraneous vari variables. So, and then from that fan mentality, we broke that down further into the hype, the significance, and the outcome. So the hype is all, and we call the fan mentality, all the, the hoopla around us. And that's like we said, records, rankings, seedings, predictions, um, what, what, we're trying to, what we're trying to do, the significance of a competition, we're, we're putting way too much pressure on ourselves. It's outside of our control. I mean, notice every one of those things is outside of our control. I'll go through it, go through it again. Hype, we can't control it. All the buzz that's going on around us, so we, we know what it feels like in the postseason where the pressure starts mounting up. We can't control that. And that's a big difference. Also, I should point this out for wrestlers. There's a big difference between the way it feels in the postseason, state tournament, national tournament, versus freestyle season. You know what I'm talking about. If you wrestle now or if you wrestled in the past, you know there's a big difference between the way it feels in season versus freestyle. Is it really just the style? Think about it. Is it really just the style? I get it. I get it. A lot of wrestlers say, oh, I like freestyle better. It's kind of like the cool thing to say. I like freestyle better. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you do like freestyle better. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. It's a lot of fun. But is it really that freestyle is so much more fun than scholastic? I mean, I get it. It's not as, as much of a grind in terms of the scrambling and the and the, to the top bottom. But I think it has a lot to do with the atmosphere, the hype. It doesn't feel the same way. I mean, maybe sometimes people are gathered around the mats, but it's it's not the same feeling at all in season. In season, you feel like you could cut the tension with a knife, whereas then freestyle, it's like the big let up. And when you think about it, you're going up again. Usually, as I remember, your first, second round, almost almost every match you have in the off season, not every match, but like a lot of the matches you're going against in, in freestyle, especially at like the state qualifiers, it's way tougher competition than most of the season. Like almost any other tournament, it would be like, if it was in season, it would be a ridiculous tournament. You're not even approaching it the same way because you don't know who's gonna show up. That's what we're saying, that the, the, as part of the prey mindset, when you don't know who is there, I mean, think about think about going into um, districts, regions, states, nationals, conference tournament, you know exactly who you're going up against. So that's in your head all the time. Whereas in freestyle, anyone might show up that day. You don't know who you're gonna wrestle. So you have no time to think about this. Now, think about what that does to the pressure that you feel before you compete. That's what that's a big difference in freestyle. I mean, and, and you feel it in practice too. How come on the day of a dual meet, you're thinking of it? I remember myself, I'd be thinking about it the whole day, who I'm going up against, what's gonna happen. Um, oh, I wrestled this, some, this guy sometimes in my club, or we wrestled last year once. Think about practice, usually at your wrestling club. You're wrestling good people almost all the time. And you're probably not, and you're going live all the time against them. You're probably not thinking too much during the day. Oh, who's this guy I'm going up against? What did they do in the past? And then, and then before, and then before wrestling them in a match, you're thinking about their accomplishments. You're thinking of past outcomes. You don't do that at all in practice, even at your club when you're going up against better competition. You don't do it almost at all in the freestyle Greco season, where you've no idea who you're going to be going up against. But during a season, everything changes. So yeah, the style's different. 
but I think it has a lot to do with this hype and fan mentality that we just switch on. It's almost like you have one DVD playing when you go to when you go wrestle at your club. You're trying to beat the other guy. You're trying to you're trying to win, so to speak. Um, and the same thing when you when you're wrestling in freestyle. But then when it's in season and it's scholastic, it's almost like you take that DVD out and you put a totally different DVD in and you start running that one. You know what I'm talking about. I I know what what it felt like when I was doing that. It felt totally different. The whole approach to the day of a dual meet, leading up to a match, leading up to a district, region, states, leading up to conference tournaments in college, it felt completely different than freestyle. You can't even tell me it didn't, because it did. So think about it. That's mostly prey mindset. It's what thoughts are preoccupying our mind. When we know who we're going up against and we're overly focused on it, it usually brings about a worse performance and we don't enjoy ourselves nearly as much. So be ready to go. Be ready to go. Treat it all the same. I get it. In season, you're going to know who your opponents are. You know who, you know, who, you know who the competition is. And a lot of you know who your opponents are going to be in the off season too. I'm not saying it's not existent, but again, treat it as no big deal. It's the same. And that's why it's very important to take practice serious too, and to really get ready to go in live. So it feels like a match right? Making matches similar to practice and making practices similar to a match. A massive red flag for me that I could tell is when an athlete is changing their personality too much. And I know it because I lived it. I'd be one way. Normally, um, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, I'm joking around. I talk a lot. I have fun. And then before a match, I'm taking it overly serious. I'm, I'm getting into this whole different zone. Like I said, it's like you're popping one DVD out and you're putting in a new DVD. And it should never be a DVD that's totally different than the other one, right? I get it. I understand that matches are different than practice. I understand scholastic matches. There's different variables than freestyle matches. I get it. But you should be able to, your approach and what you're going to focus on and the amount of time you're going to focus on wrestling and what specific things you're going to be focusing on, like not who the guy is, not what happened the last time you compete. Technical aspects are fine. It should not be a big difference between practice and a match. Freestyle versus folk style. Um, club versus, versus dual meet. Treat it all the same. Make sure, so as we close up this episode, like I said, it's chapter two right there. Parts of chapter two. It's a long chapter. Make sure you follow us on all forms of social media. Like our video. Subscribe to the page. Hit the bell so you get constant reminders. If you're interested in being a mindset coach, we need more good mentors. We have a lot of wrestlers that are coming into the program, joining we need good people who are going to help them. So if this is something you or a friend wants to do part-time, we'd love to have you as a mindset coach. Let us know. Send us an email, mindset at wrestlingmindset.com, and we'll talk. Remember, whether it's wrestling, school, business, or life, mindset makes the difference. We'll see you next week.